I'm Paul Gonin, and I'm a cubic thinker. And my talk today will be about uh, first steps in using uh, OpenSUSE Cubic, which I have been using for a few months, coming from an uh, OpenSUSE background. Uh, and I got to make a lot of interesting discoveries in that journey, and I'm going to share it today. Um, thanks for all the attendance today on a Sunday. Uh, it's very impressive. Uh, very committed into OpenSUSE. And um, I've been working at SUSE for a few years now, and recently I started to work more on containers, containerization, and I wanted to, myself, increase my knowledge and develop my skills, so I decided to use, for my personal use, uh, Cubic more and more. And I will show you today about Cubic. So first, what is Cubic? Um, it's defined as the container as a service platform based on Kubernetes atop OpenSUSE micro OS. Then you might ask what's, micro, what's OpenSUSE micro OS. And as a few pointed the last few days, uh, micro refers not to its size, but to the fact that it's specialized for uh, microservices architecture. And uh, it's designed to host container workloads uh, with automated administration and patching, and uh, <clears throat> being the suited environment for running containers in the OpenSUSE environment. So as of today, um, what can you do or not uh, with Cubic? Well, it's a perfect platform to host containers. It's ready for that. You can, re you can run containers with Docker, works perfectly out of the box. And you can also uh, run containers with Podman, run C, which is uh, kind of a cutting edge technology, recent technology for containers. You can also deploy Kubernetes because you get uh, Kubernetes packages for OpenSUSE are available. Uh, although QBADM is not available yet, we have some uh, issues we're still working on, at least the last time I checked. And supposedly, you could deploy Kubernetes by hand, or as it is called, the hard way, uh, which is a 14 chapters book with 2,500 lines of documentation. I think it works. I never tried myself, and um, I never had anyone reporting it worked. So I'm not claiming it works, but it should. Anyway, my talk today won't be about uh, Kubernetes because, as I pointed out, um, I used it for personal uh, workloads, professional environment mostly, but still uh, one user also. And running that on Kubernetes would be overkill. And I wanted to focus, and as the, as the Cloud Native uh, Foundation pointed out, the, the path to microservices uh, well, first, you need to know about containers. You need to containerize. You need to run some containers. Orchestration can come once you're more uh, comfortable and, and uh, familiar with it. So I will show some of the uh, things I've been doing with Cubic. So how to install OpenSUSE Cubic? Uh, what are your options there to run Cubic? Well, you can get the ISO to run on bare metal on virtualized environment. This is actually what the official website offers. Currently, cubic.opensuzy.org, there is a download site, a download button, sorry, that points to an ISO that you can use to uh, install um, a Cubic. It's very traditional. It's using the same building blocks as other OpenSUSE distribution. It's actually I think it's it's not a distribution, it's a, it's a flavor of tumbleweed, uh, if I'm right. So it's basically a tumbleweed, but built with different choices, architecture, uh, and a specialized workflow for the installation. But it's basically uh, tumbleweed packages and uh, tumbleweed building blocks. So you have the option to use the Yast installer, uh, which kick-ass. Um, you can use AutoYast for... Um, 
uh, automation of installation and a uh, very similar way uh, that people are doing it for years. And the ISO is tested in OpenQA as part of the Tumbleweed um, testing workflow. Uh, thanks to uh, great guys, we're doing the uh, uh, testing, which means already we have a lot of testing on the ISO, which is done like testing Run C, uh, testing Docker, testing um, rootless containers, a lot of uh, great things are done. And QBADM is already being tested and fails currently, which is something we hope will be fixed soon. So when you install it, you, you have the option to use the ISO to install on um, bare metal and virtualized environment. It's a very uh, traditional installer for people who are familiar with OpenSUSE. Although there are new roles that you can, at the start of the installation, there are new roles to pick from. The first one is the uh, OpenSUSE microOS, the plain node. That's the one I've been using to deploy on a bare metal server and run containers. There are other options, the uh, unconfigured on cluster node, the admin dashboard, and the cluster node. Those are meant for uh, using with uh, Kubernetes and building cluster, uh, but I'm not covering this today. And it's a very simplified workflow to actually install it, very, very quick, because you basically have to configure your system administrator password, then you have um, the uh, storage choices to make, uh, package selection, and boom, it performs the installation, it's very quick. Uh, the fact that it's a separate installer makes it very, very uh, easy to get started because you don't get confused with all the options and find the right way. It really gives you an easy path into installing it. Um, there are not so many options, just things that make sense for someone, even without knowledge of what you want to do with containers. You can just install it. it just, it's just going to ask you for standard uh, parameters of installing a a distribution. Then um, there are also virtualization disk images which are built with the uh, OBS and Kiwi. Um, so I've put a, a little label on it. It's still under development. It's not tested. It's not going in OpenQA. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of manual testing yet. So it's for people who are interested to um, try with disk images. Those disk images are available for KVM, for Xen, uh, VMware, and Hyper-V, and also there is an OpenStack uh, disk image. I put the link uh, here if you want to get them and, and experiment. So about the virtualization disk images, why would you want to use them? Well, the installation process, as I described, it's quite quick because it doesn't ask you uh, to answer, to provide a lot of information. But the actual installation process of writing all the, the packages into the system is still quite long. It still takes some time. If you do it once, well, you can afford it. But if you plan to do it over and over, uh, it's a significant amount of time. And the disk images are actually much faster uh, for uh, getting started. Uh, I would say my estimation is that if you use the installation process, it will take you end-to-end -end about 15 minutes to get your system installed, while with disk images, uh, you can boot in about two minutes. So it's, it's a significant um, time you can uh, save. And also, uh, for some use cases, like if you're using a continuous integration or uh, you're constantly deploying new systems, it's definitely a time saver if you're using a virtualized environment. If you are to use the virtualization disk images, um, you need to provide some information when you boot the system so that it's personalized to your case. And for that, the choice has been made to use CloudInit, uh, which comes from the cloud world. I think initially it's, it's basically from AWS uh, EC2, and it's been extended to be used in, in various um, um, situations. And we're using it now for CloudInit, for Cubic. 
Obviously, for the OpenStack um, images, it's built in, in OpenStack, so you can provide the cloud init file in the uh, given location in the uh, bootstrap of your instance. And um, it will be used when you bootstrap the instance. But what if you're using virtualization? Because this is not meant uh, to be used. Um, it's not a typical use case in virtualization to use cloud in it. So a cloud init file is basically um, a simple text file that contains uh, the information you want to set on your system on the first boot of that system. So here I provided one where the time zone is set, a password is set, but you can uh, provide SSH keys as well. You can set your NTP servers, DNS, whatever system configuration. There is a lot of automation you can do with cloud in it. You can also provide uh, endpoints to a uh, configuration management system like Chef, Ansible, uh, Event Salt is possible. So you basically provide anything, everything you need to configure and start your system and, and possibly hand over to other more advanced configuration solutions like, like uh, Salt and the likes. And specifically, so it works quite um, naturally on, on clouds. It's a very typical use uh, in clouds. But for virtualization, the way you can use it is actually there is an option to use it as um, a local provider. And for that, you actually create your files, uh, put them into a CD-ROM uh, file system, create a, a, a CD-ROM disk image, and you attach that CD-ROM um, at the boot of your image. And cloud in it will look as one of the um, part of the workflow, it checks for the metadata service for cloud server providers, doesn't find it, then it will look for a CD-ROM, and it will get the, uh, it will see that there is a CD-ROM attached, and it will look for the files that configure the system. And that's how we've been using it with um, Cubic. And that works with, and it's been tested actually with all the, um, uh, also with the, all the virtualization technologies, we've been using it with uh, VMware, with Hyper-V, with KVM, with Xen. It works on all these environments. Then there is a last option, which is Raspberry Pis. So for that, you need, well, a Raspberry Pi, 64-bit um, one. You need an SD card, and you need to ask nicely to Richard Brown, because he's the one who's been building that image, and uh, most likely it will be able to tell you if it works or not, and if you should be using it. But also you should let him know that you're going to use it, because it, it will be very happy that you're using it. Because we'd like, that's an area where we'd like to have uh, Cubic uh, being used on a regular basis in a short time, so it's, it's definitely um, um, a place where we'd like to see people more and more using it. So that's, that's about installing it. There are a lot of options. Uh, we're working, and definitely we will be considering other options. We have the power of the OBS for us. Um, we're not, at this time, we have quite a lot um, options uh, on the table. And for the community we have so far, it's, it's already quite a lot. But we could definitely extend this uh, later on and build uh, images for public clouds. That's something that we can if there is a demand and if there are people who are working on this, it will definitely happen uh, more boards, more on boards. Since, um, Tumbleweed, since Cubic is Tumbleweed based, um, basically the support of Tumbleweed on the on boards will mean that Cubic uh, will be supported as well. Um, I would pref personally really like to see Cubic on the Pine64, but we'll see about this. And um, uh, then, so you have it installed, uh, now what? Well, um, you can start containers as soon as it is installed. By default, uh, Docker uh, is installed. I'm not quite sure, I'm, I'm not 100% sure anymore because it's been a few months ago, but I think you have to start by enabling and starting the Docker daemon as a first step or not. Not sure, 100 percent. It's not. Are you fake? Okay, so I had to, but now it's not anymore. Yeah, I wanted to look into OpenQA if it was still the case, but yeah, 
time and stuff. Anyway, so yeah, right out of the box, you can run containers. No need to start installing Docker. Really, just you have installed Cubic, you can start pull containers. As I showed here, you just pull the OpenSUSE leap container. It gets the uh, image. You start, uh, you run a container with it, and bam, that's it. So it's very quick to install, and you can run your containers out of the box quickly. So it's this is what it is for running containers. So that works. That was actually a very um, positive experience because I was very happy. I just install it. I run a container. That's so easy. It doesn't take much time. Then next, well, the default installation. I'm missing stuff. Um, in my case, I was missing Tmux, so I say, okay, let's install packages. And this is where the fun begins. So, what I do, I'm an OpenSUSE user. I've been using Tubbleweed for a few years now. I do Zipper. Zipper search, Tmux, yeah, it's there, of course. It's in Tumbleweed, so it's available for Cubic as well. So I do Zipper in, Tmux, gets all the packages. I'm happy, it works well. Then downloads everything, and boom, error. I'm like, what? What? I can't zipper anymore? What's, what's this? And it says something, I have to read it, yeah. Something about an RPM lock. I'm like, woof, it's, this thing is not working yet. Well, thing is, um, Cubic has a new architecture. And, and what makes it different from a regular Tumbleweed or OpenSUSE uh, leap uh, deployment is it's using a root um, uh, read-only root file system and it's using transactional updates uh, which are atomic and, and and all of this. I actually heard about all of this. I, I, I watched talked uh, talks about this. I was like, yeah, this is very, very impressive. It looks like the future, but I actually didn't realize what it meant. And th this is what it means. You cannot use zipper anymore. You cannot install a package. So I went on the RC channel and I said, okay, sorry, me again, um, zipper doesn't work, should I report a bug? <laughs> well, Richard was very nice and he said, yeah, well, no, because that's supposed to be like this. Ah, it's supposed to be like this, okay. And I got some explanation. So there is actually a new command that is meant to be used here. It's transactional update, package, install, and then the name of the package. Um, that will actually look very like a zipper. You will see it's actually pulling the packages, installing and everything and so on. But it will explain that actually it's writing all of this into a new, a new snapshot of your ButterFS file system. And um, it's not actually installing it yet. It's just in that new file, uh, in that new uh, snapshot. So it looks very, it, once you have understood, understood this, it's very easy. You just replace zipper in by transactional update package in, and that's it. Boom, you can install packages. Well, you install a package. Well, then you want to use what you have installed. You typed, not found. Like, oh. It said it worked. What's wrong? Well, it's installed in a new snapshot, which means it's not installed on the current system you're running. It's not installed on your uh, running snapshot. So you have to reboot the system at this stage. So you reboot. You do the reboot, and then you wait. Well, in my case, I installed on bare metal, so I had to wait. And actually, in my case, it was an HP server, so I had to wait. I don't know what these servers are doing at boot, but. Man, they have some mag magic tricks they do at boot to make sure everything's fine. I mean, it's, but it takes forever. I mean, it, it's actually longer to boot that server than using a virtual machine, a new virtual machine. But yeah, at least I'm on bare metal. I mean, I'm not. All right, so I reboot. And then, yeah, it's available. I can use it. Uh, uh, well, in that case, QBADM, I can, I can display the version, I cannot start bootstrapping a, a Kubernetes cluster, but soon. Then, now you're very, very happy with yourself. You can install packages. So what you do? Well, install everything you need. So 
you start transactional packaging. Uh, yeah, I've been to a very good talk about TLS and Apache 2 and everything, so I want to do the same. So I install Apache 2, and then I install the hydrated, the module for Apache 2, and I reboot. Well, wrong. Something's wrong here. Do you know what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, the thing here, the error is, you're, you think you have installed two packages, you have installed two set of packages. Well, actually, you have installed on the first snapshot, and then, so you have created a new snapshot, and you have installed dehydrated and dehydrated by Apache 2, and then you have uh, installed in a new snapshot uh, Apache 2, two different snapshots. And actually, when you will reboot, you will use that last snapshot, and you will be missing dehydrated. So, well, here I really recommend um, the talk from uh, Ignaz yesterday on uh, transactional updates, deep dive, deep dive. Everything's explained in more details here. It was really just about showing my experience with it and 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 how you can uh, fast forward your experience by learning all these um, things. Um, so you have to, you can't just do as you, you really have to plan what you need and install everything at once, or maybe there are other options like using a shell, install stuff. I mean, there are definitely possible ways to optimize, but you have to be careful here because you're using different snapshots, you reboot, you only use the last snapshot. Okay, so that's about transactional update. One thing you need to know about um, uh, Cubic, as I, I wish I had taken a picture of Richard uh, and Alex during the talk when, when he has this quote that says, no sysadmin ever wanted to touch a system or something like this. I really wish I had a picture to illustrate it because here you will have to learn about something called a reboot manager because updates on Cubic are um, installed automatically, which means every time there is a new update, um, it will prepare, it will get all the updates installed on a new snapshot and it will tell the reboot manager that the system needs to be rebooted. Uh, and then the reboot manager is using a configuration file, which here I pointed, the reboot manager conf. And it actually sets a time, a time window, that during which the system will be rebooted when it's asked, when a reboot has been asked. So here, on my system, that's the default with Cubic, it's going to reboot at 3.30 UTC, which in Prague time currently is 5.30 in the morning. So you can check with the reboot manager CTL command what's the status, if a reboot is going to happen soon. And you can, one very important file you need to look is the transactional update log because it will tell you all the updates that, has been, that have been applied to your system uh, without asking any uh, constant of you, 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 it just depends. It just does it all the time. And so, Cubic is tumbleweed based, which means updates are quite frequent. My mileage is that it's many times a week. I don't know, two, three times a week that there, you will get updates, which means you will get your system rebooted two, three times a week. I was actually very, very disappointed because when I started to use Cubic, after a few days, I looked at my uptime and I was like, it was very small and I was like, oh, this is, it's always broken. No, it's actually, it's just rebooting because it's, it's always getting these new updates and automatically apply them to your system. Well, then if you have started containers, in some cases, what you want is a container that's going to be uh, a long uh, life, type of application, I don't know, some sort of web application, uh, some sort of daemon, anything you're going to start. And every time you get documentation on how, on, on how to start a container, 
uh, with Docker, most of the time it doesn't use that option, which is the restart always, uh, because, well, with Cubic you really have to have your containers to restart automatically, otherwise it will be always off, because it's rebooting and you lose um, your containers. So, um, one, um, recently we've started to have uh, Podman available. Uh, that's another way of uh, running containers on Cubic. Uh, it replaces or it's an, an alternative to the client of the Docker open source engine. So you can just install it with the transactional update package in Podman. Uh, you reboot your system, and then you can start um, pulling images here from the Docker uh, image app, and you can start um, running containers with Podman. Works just also, you just have to install it, it's not out of the box like Docker, but it's very easy to start using it uh, on Cubic. I put the link uh, to a blog post that goes into details of how to use uh, Podman on OpenSUSE. Okay. Um, since we don't have orchestration yet, um, uh, it's very, very simple common line stuff. I started to use um, a project uh, which is called Portainer. Portainer um, gives you a web interface to um, manage your container host, to manage your containers. Um, I know some people don't like too much GUIs, uh, they think common line is the best. And I, I agree sometimes common line is, is much more powerful, especially if you want to automate. And, and But when you're learning, when you're discovering a new technology, the advantage of GUIs and especially Portainer, it really gives you good information of everything you should consider uh, in your system. Uh, related to containers. Uh, well, I lost a slide. Um, it's actually very easy to start because it's, um, it's a container. It comes as a container, so you just have to start a container. There is a one line to start the container on your system. And then you just access it with your browser. You just have some initial steps to create an admin user. Uh, give it a password, get started, and then you have this um, web UI, very classical, where everything related to your containers can be managed and you can collect all the information. So you get information about your uh, containers which are running, which, which ones are stopped, you can get information about which images are available in your system, uh, you can manage your volumes, your network, and Docker has grown and containers has grown much, much more complicated than it used to be. And, and that's a very good way of looking at what's your system status, uh, how things are currently running. And um, especially in, in network-related uh, topics uh, can become sometimes a little bit confusing where you're at, and, and that gives you a good view of what are your networks currently on your system. Okay, so conclusion. Um, OpenSUSE Cubic is fun. Honestly, it is. It's, it's very pleasant to use if you want to run uh, containers. In my case, I didn't like, well, for some time, I run containers on my workstation. And that was a bad idea. I mean, I think it was a bad idea because, um, well, Supposedly you have some isolation, but then you start to use your better FS sub volumes, you create images, then they stay, and it, it can really quickly create a mess. And and that and that's I always I've always been that kind of person who likes to run I mean to have a workstation for working, but it can be off, it can be destroyed, I, it doesn't need to be kept in a good um, condition. And anything that needs to be um, any workload that needs to be run kind of production should be out of the workstation or even testing should be on a different environment, not testing on the workstation. I don't like it too much. 
you can actually use it on your workstation, like if you want to have some virtual machine or anything like this, but I like it to have outside. And that's a very good environment to actually run containers. It's very quick. You can learn how to use containers, build containers, everything you want to learn with containers, you can do it on Cubic. And it's, it's very stable, actually. It's, it's, it's a tumbleweed, so it's stable as tumbleweed, so quite solid. It's tested in OpenQA, so it gets a lot of testing. And um, uh, it supports all the platforms that uh, tumbleweed is supporting as well. It's a very wide uh, set of systems you can run it on. Uh, modern systems are quickly uh, supported, but you get also some rather old systems also supported. In my case, I really used a very, very old HP servers that basically we don't use it anymore because we, can't, we cannot use it for virtualization, we cannot do much with it, but it's great for uh, running containers. And, you know. the, um, the real, I mean, I really discover what's the reality of admin free. I mean, that system also, I never care about it. It's just updated all the time, always. Every time a new, uh, every time a new patch is available, it's applied. And that's, that's, there's some kind of magic there because you, it's, it's really, you, you really stop caring about like petting that system. You don't have to connect and say, okay, what are the updates? Okay, I'm going to apply. It's just, it's done. It's done. It's always at the best level out of the box. And I trust it to be very safe. I'm, I'm very fortunate nothing wrong happened to me. So I didn't have to roll back to a snapshot. The last time, everything you learned that is great that you actually never did it. You just wish you don't have to do it. But I kind of trust that this is actually, since it's being used in, in SLE and, and uh, it's, it's people that are serious who are talking about this, I think I feel safe. It's updated and I feel safe. And um, it really saves time. I don't have to worry about it. So and my conclusion in, in that talk is, is don't hesitate to try and use it. Um, you might hear it's not ready because um, you cannot build a Kubernetes cluster yet. There, it's still, you don't have everything you need to quickly, but you don't need that. I mean, many people, they don't need that. You just, if you want to start using containers, if you want to play with um, containerization, you can just go ahead. It's, it's ready for that. Uh, it's perfectly fine. And if you want, if you're actually interested for um, doing Kubernetes stuff, there are a lot of options there. You have the packages, you can start deploying, you could try recipes from salt, you can try even other solutions like trying to get kubeadm to work or even, I don't know, anything else crazy like using Ansible or Chef, whatever you want. So it's available for that. Thanks a lot. Um, any question? Yeah, uh, I have one question. So when you have a uh, reboot schedule because you got your package updated and then you do, a, what is it called, a transactional update package in something, then you create a new snapshot and when you re reboot, then you reboot in a snapshot where the updated packages are not in. No, no, the packages are in because if, if the re... Oh. Huh. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's why I put remote manager status. That means if a reboot is scheduled, I would not install package. I would, wait, I would first reboot. I mean, the safe, the, indeed the safe uh, option is to uh, reboot your system before starting to install packages. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure transactional update now gives a message when it's going to discard a snapshot because there's unapplied changes. So you're at least aware of what's going on when you're doing it interactively. So then my question is, um, can you actually with one command 
update, apply all updates and install a package. Um, sorry again? Yeah, because uh, the updates would be lost and I want to install a package. I don't, I want to save the reboot because maybe I'm also on this old HP server. So I want to have a, create a single snapshot with updates plus my additional package I want to install. Maybe Ignaz knows. Um, not with one single simple command, let's say. Uh, you can still call transactional update, for example. Also, transaction update up and uh, uh, extended with an, ex an additional shell command. So, transactional update up shell. <laughs> this will give you a shell. It will first do the update itself and then in that shell you can append whatever you want to do in that snapshot because it will be it will just execute all the commands doing in that uh, before closing the, that snapshot and setting it to read only and when you just install some packages yeah those will also be included in the snapshot then yeah but it's not it's a hack it's a workaround <laughs> so maybe a valid feature request is to chain the sub commands to transactional update that's not so simple because um, you still have to separate all those commands. We have to know which snapshot was the last working good one because if something breaks, we have to roll back. Um, Paul just said it, it's a self-updating, self-healing system which just works out of the box. And we detect um, errors which may happen um, and we have to roll back. If you combine multiple commands, we don't know which was the last working snapshot. You do the same when you call up plus the shell command and then you do something, so you're atomic with both operations in one go. That's why I'm saying chain the sub commands to transactional update command, you know. In the background, transactional update is just a wrapper around super. Uh, so you, you just, you also can't call super update install. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, as uh, Inya said, and uh, as you mentioned, um, Cubic is kind of you let it run and it will update automatically. Automatically, um, is it? self-healing in the sense we push an update by mistake uh, I don't know um, we are not able to mount some file system and we need to roll back quickly um, since there is a reboot manager it will be automatically rebooted and then the system is not able to properly boot completely is cubic able to kind of self-heal and detect oh I, I'm not able to fully reboot running and then reboot automatically to the previous snapshot or is it something which could happen in the future? Well, not to my knowledge, but I think Richard should answer that. Yeah, kind of. Um, so for those situations where it's like partially booted, so the operating system's fine, but some of your services haven't booted, um, there is a service called Health Check, which is installed by default and looking um, for the kind of standard Docker Kubernetes services to make sure they're fine. So if they don't start up right, yes, it will work. Uh, Health Check is, is uh, uh, plug-in aware, so you could make your own plugins to check other specific stuff for, for that. So if the machine can't boot at all, yeah, but at least then of course we have... Okay, if it doesn't come up at all, Ignaz has implemented a new check, so Grub will fix it. So yeah, so in most cases it's self-healing. Awesome, I didn't know about that. Any more questions? Um, yesterday in the OpenSUSE conference, there was a workshop about building containers using build service. 
Have you maybe tried or uh, do you have any idea if uh, the same tooling <laughs> is available also in Cubic? Uh, or not there yet? For running the containers or building uh, no, no, the containers? For uh, building them and pushing them to build service, like doing everything inside Cubic, not having tumble with it. I would not use Cubic to build containers. Uh, I, I, I don't say it's the wrong or right, but I wouldn't. I, I, what I tried is to run containers from the build service because it's basically a registry and you just have to point to that registry when you're uh, pulling the image instead of using the Docker Hub. Um, since since Tumbleweed, if it works on Tumbleweed, it should also work on, on Cubic. But um, yeah, I wouldn't build containers. Maybe as part of a CI it makes sense, but I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Richard, okay. what do you think? Yeah, but the the answer to your question is no. I have not tested that. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thanks a lot.